now that I'm done talking at you, I'm excited to present Eli Biscetto. Eli is the author of three Oregon hiking guidebooks, Hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, Oregon, Day Hiking Mount Hood, and Urban Trails, Portland. He is the founder of PCT Oregon and serves on the advisory council of the Oregon Trails Coalition. Welcome, Eli. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Uh, thanks for inviting me to come back and uh, talk about uh, some more of uh, Oregon hiking and all it has to offer. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody to, that's uh, joining us tonight. Happy to have you with us. Hope you all are doing well and staying safe in the uh, unusual situation we're all in right now. Um, Tonight, I'm going to be talking about my new guidebook, Day Hiking Mount Hood. This just came out from uh, Mountaineers Books as part of their Day Hiking series. Um, we're uh, gonna be talking about a selection of trails that might be appropriate for the situation that we're in right now, uh, considering that um, uh, the topic at hand is is social distancing and staying safe. Sorry about that, just uh, getting uh, situated here. Social distancing and staying safe in the outdoors um, as uh, we kind of get used to a new normal. Um, so uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, how you might be able to go about and do that this summer as um, people are seeking uh, to get outdoors, as the weather is getting nice, summer is approaching, and a lot of the uh, recreational things that we might be used to otherwise may be limited or no longer available. Um, one of my favorite features about the Day Hiking Mount Good Hood series is that in the very beginning of the book, if any of you have it, uh, feel free to follow along, is um, this chart that they have that's called Hikes at a Glance. Um, and uh, this pretty much tells you where you can go at any time to hike a trail where you might be looking for something in particular. And I designed this one in particular for a seasonal approach so that if uh, you're looking for spring flowers, it might tell you where you can go and find some nice color on the mountain. If you're looking for fall color, um, same thing. Also, if you might wanna be hiking with your children or with dogs, good trails that will be good for that. Um, and there's also some winter trail recommendations in there for uh, getting away during the uh, snowy season, which um, we're in the process of wrapping up right now. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, this summer is gonna be a little bit different and we're gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be talking about how to recreate responsibly when you get out there and hike some of those trails and just go over a few tips before we dive into the good stuff. Um, to uh, help you be safe out there this summer um, as you look to get outdoors. So first and foremost, you want to know what's going on where you want to go. Um, because um, things, uh, a lot of things on Mount Hood are still covered in snow. Roads might not be accessible and uh, facilities might not be available. Um, the forest recently opened uh, just a couple of weeks ago, but a lot of that is for day use and ranger stations, visitor centers, uh, restrooms even might not be available. So it's a good idea to um, know what's available to you before you head on up the mountain. Um, you wanna plan ahead, make sure you have everything that you need for getting out there so that you can, uh, you can make sure you have stuff to eat, stuff to drink on trail, uh, carry your hand sanitizer, you might want to carry a face mask with you so uh, you have one available if you get to a crowded trailhead um, and this way you're not um, expecting to have to make any unnecessary stops at any small towns that uh, might be under uh, under stress right now um, it's a good idea to stay close to home right now um, as it is a lot of stuff is open just for day use uh, presently so um, there's uh, not a uh, big demand for doing those big far trips right now. Um, again, social distancing, physical distancing, that's the name of the game these days. We're gonna be talking about that as we dive into the trail section. And um, it's also a good idea to play it safe out there, not take any unnecessary risks because 
search and rescue and medical services are really strained right now. So um, if you get into trouble by doing some off-trail roaming, some uh, unnecessary bushwhacking, or getting into a situation that might be too difficult for your experience level, like right now, you might be getting into a lot of snow, so uh, navigation would be a key thing. Um, it's a good idea to avoid those unnecessary risks and just keep to the keep to the known trails, carry your good map, and um, always leave your itinerary behind uh, with someone uh, before you head out there. And of course, we want to make sure that we're leaving no trace out there so that we can keep our trails and our public lands nice and clean uh, because, um, again, services right now are really strained and limited. So while there might be a trash can at a trailhead, it might not be getting emptied very uh, frequently. And as such happens, they tend to overflow, spill trash out all over parking areas and trailheads, and it just becomes unsightly. So uh, right now, everybody is recommending that you pack out everything that you pack in, even if there's a trash can available, just let it be. Take all your uh, waste home and dispose of it there. That way we can keep our uh, outdoor areas and backcountry areas nice and clean. So let's dive into talking about some uh, hiking options where you can go and explore Mount Hood. Um, these are all trails that are included in um, day hiking Mount Hood, just kind of taking a different approach. And um, as you follow along, you might notice little numbers associated with the titles of some of these trails. Those correlate to the hike numbers that are in the guidebook. So if you want more information, you can just look those up and that'll give you a full description of uh, all the info about that hike, trail details, um, and other features associated with that particular area. So let's start off by taking what I call a different point of view. Um, when you think about going for big view hikes on Mount Hood, you automatically think of hiking trails like Lookout Mountain, Bald Mountain, Mirror Lake, maybe McNeil Point. And um, for very good reason, those are very popular trails because the views from those locations are fantastic. Um, however, that's where everybody likes to go. And if we're thinking about staying away from the big crowds, those are trails that we probably want to avoid this summer. And there are plenty of other trails that offer great views that are often lesser traveled that offer, you know, big mountain views and scenery equal to some of these more popular trails. And we're going to start off with Paiu Mountain, which is located on the west side of Mount Hood, and you can reach this area by way of the Pacific Crest Trail at Lolo Pass. Now, you don't actually climb to the top of Hayu Mountain because it's part of the Bull Run Watershed Protected Area, but by trekking north on the Pacific Crest Trail from Lolo Pass, you can skirt the flanks of Hayu Mountain and enjoy some really nice views of Mount Hood and some of its wider valleys on the north side like you see in the image right here um, there's uh you can uh, do a half day day hike and go to um, the huckleberry mountain area or you could turn it into a full day adventure and trek all the way to buck peak for even bigger and wider views um, the trail through here is especially nice in fall because there's lots of fall color summer brings lots of berries and uh the crowds are fairly minimal because uh, the only people that are usually hiking through here usually are Pacific Crest Trail through hikers racing to get to burgers and beer in Cascade Locks. But with so few of those on the trail this year, you might be able to hike this and have it all to yourself. Another good trail to hike, this one being on the south side of Mount Hood for some great views, is Bonnie Butte. Uh, this one is directly south of the White River area and is in part of the Badger Creek Wilderness, which I believe where uh, Eric will be sharing some more information about later in the program. And uh, here you can get up to the top of Bonnie Butte, enjoy some fantastic views in the Badger Creek Wilderness area, and uh, also take a side trip around some pretty picturesque meadows. And as you can see, 
you got Mount Hood peeking over the ridge line right there. A really nice way to get away and uh, again, avoid some of those bigger crowds at the bigger viewpoints. And uh, the last one in this category is Owl Point. This is accessible by, the, by way of the old Vista Ridge Trail. This is the lower portion of the uh, more commonly known Vista Ridge, Vista Ridge Trail. Uh, this trail actually officially just reopened a little over a year ago, uh, thanks to a lot of the efforts of the Trail Keepers of Oregon getting in and logging out uh, the lower portion of this trail, which had been abandoned by the Forest Service for decades. Um, and the really cool thing is, is while the upper portion of the trail was uh, burned pretty badly in a fire about uh, 10 years ago, the lower portion stayed uh, fairly intact and is still forested with tons of berries. And uh, there's two really great viewpoints uh, accessible from this trail, the Rock Pile and Owl Point, which give you, as you can see, these wide views over the whole northern Mount Hood area where you can see uh, Pinnacle Ridge, Vista Ridge, um, Elk Cove Ridge, um, as far as Lawrence Lake and all the way up to Mount Hood. So great views and it's far enough out there that um, not a lot of people who are uh, looking for quick and easy trail access are going to make the effort to get here. Um, so another good one to get away from those crowds. So now with summer coming in, weather's going to warm up everybody likes flocking to water. Um, the problem is, especially with regards to this summer, is water draws those crowds. We want to avoid those crowds. But there are ways to enjoy some water on the mountain without going to those really popular areas. So my suggestion for this summer would be uh, those really popular areas like Ramona Falls, Tamawanas Falls, Burnt Lake, Mirror Lake, Keep those on your to-do list for another time. And this summer, try out something different like Cast Lake. Um, Cast Lake is a really pretty forested lake in a high cirque on the Zigzag Mountain Range, which is just west of Mount Hood. It's a long climb to get up here, but uh, this trail actually sees very few travelers. Um, it makes a nice place. Uh, for a daytime picnic or a nice easy overnight. Um, it's a long haul to get up there, but um, it affords some fantastic views and it's a nice place to enjoy some fishing or a quiet uh, lake up in uh, some high mountain area. Um, if uh, you happen to be following uh, my Instagram, which is at PCT Oregon, you might have noticed a photo I posted the other day that showed this particular view of Mount Hood. This is the view that you get on the way to Cast Lake. It's one of the best views I've seen of Mount Hood and not a whole lot of people get it because this trail is so little traveled. Another great way to enjoy some water during the summer on Mount Hood is to head for Timothy Lake. Now you might be saying, what do you mean Timothy Lake? That place is a zoo during summertime and Yes, it is. If you head to the south end of the lake, where all the campgrounds and picnic areas and uh, parking lots are, but if you backdoor the lake from the little tiny little crater campground up on the north side, then you can leave all those crowds behind. There's a short little trail which passes uh, Little Crater Lake and connects with the Pacific Crest Trail. And if you turn south on the Pacific Crest Trail, in just a short while, you'll get to the north end of Timothy Lake. And you have your choice of exploring either the east, east shore or the west shore. And not a lot of people venture into this area. So it's a good way to enjoy the lake and avoid all of those really busy uh, campgrounds and visitor areas on the south end. Um, and uh, have a nice day out on the lake. And then uh, for something more rugged for people who really want to get away from everyone and uh, see a really pretty waterfall, you can hike up to the head of Heather Canyon. Now Heather Canyon you might sound familiar to you skiers and snowboarders because it's one of the better backcountry areas 
as part of the Mount Hood Meadows Ski Resort. But when all that snow is gone and the trails are accessible, you can actually hike back up into those that area. And if you look in the kind of upper right corner, directly under the peak of Mount Hood, you might see what looks like a little tiny waterfall spilling over a little, a little ledge there. Well, that waterfall is actually quite large and the trail, as it traverses that ridge line, actually crosses over right over the top of that waterfall. And it's actually a pretty big and impressive falls once you get up close to it. Nice way to enjoy a misty waterfall on Mount Hood with, uh, without a lot of those crowds because not a lot of people venture into this area. Uh, to get there, you have to use um, one of the popular trailheads, the Elk Meadows Trailhead. So uh, wear your mask, exercise your distancing until you get to uh, the connector trail, which leads you up into the Heather Canyon area. And uh, once you leave those folks behind, you can ditch your mask, enjoy some fresh air, and then enjoy all this big alpine scenery uh, without having to deal with a lot of crowds there. The final category that I wanted to share with you tonight and a handful of hike selections is just a way to get away from all of it because um, with uh, Mount Hood, you know, obviously being Oregon's tallest peak draws a ton of visitors, tourists, hikers, people flocking to the Timberline Lodge and those easily accessible trails. Well, here's a way to enjoy Mount Hood on some lesser traveled trails where you have to do a little bit more work, but the payoffs are really big in the end. So again, avoid those trails this summer like Elk Meadow, Cooper Spur, McNeil Point, uh, Tom, Dick and Harry and Mirror Lake and try one of these so that you can leave those crowds behind. So the first one that I wanted to recommend is Paradise Park. Now, if anybody's hiked Mount Hood, you might be thinking Paradise Park is not a secluded trail. Um, and that is absolutely true if you're hiking it from the Timberline Lodge, because that's where most people start. Another way you can backdoor Paradise Park is to start on the very little used trailhead down on Kiwanis Camp Road, which is west of Government Camp, lower on the mountain. And you're essentially hiking straight up the side of the mountain, all the way up to the Timberline where you can get into Paradise Park. It's a long hike through a lot of berry and rhododendron. There's not a lot of views along the way, which is why not a lot of people use this trail. But once you get up to the Paradise Park area, there's plenty of room to spread out and enjoy the area and stay away from those crowds without having to deal with that conga line of hikers coming back and forth from Timberline Lodge. And you can still enjoy those great big views up there, the flower meadows, the springs and everything. Uh, so definitely one to consider. That would be a full day hike uh, because it's, uh, as you can see, almost a 14 mile round trip with a lot of gain. So um, plan a big day for that one. Um, a good ridge hike over on the east side of the mountain uh, where you get a different, uh, where you get a bit of a change of scenery, um, where you get some of that West Cascades uh, scenery blending with East Cascades scenery, especially in the way of trees, where you get ponderosas and oaks mixing with hemlocks and firs, um, is Palali Ridge, which is actually in the Cooper Spur Ski area. Um, you don't often associate hiking with this particular area, but uh, by utilizing a couple of the ski trails, which are uh, which do have established trails and are, I want to say, mostly well marked, uh, you can enjoy some really great mountain views. Um, the caveat to this one is there is a big stretch in the middle going up the mountain, which is pretty significantly overgrown because this trail is not maintained regularly. But if you don't mind a little bushwhacking, um, you can get up, enjoy some really good mountain views um, uh, all the way out to Washington's Cascade Range. Uh, you can see Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, as well as a really big in-your-face view of Mount Hood 
uh, which uh, has a particular angle that you uh, won't see uh, in a lot of other places. Um, now looking to the north side of the mountain, this is definitely the lesser used side of the mountain because it takes a little more effort to get there. So um, that's a plus right there. Fewer people go into this area. Um, you can hike a couple of the north side's longer ridge lines. Um, this one being um, the ridge up to Elk Cove and then the next one we'll talk about which is um, Pinnacle Ridge. But um, uh, this one is at the top of a long view packed ridge getting into some wide meadows um, and some uh, additional trail uh, exploration options for going into Elk Cove or maybe over to Little Dollar Lake. Um, start early because this is a long trail with lots of gain, but um, it gives you plenty of opportunity to spread out and practice some of that social distancing to stay away from uh, groups of other hikers. And then the last one that I wanted to highlight tonight is um, I'm going to say uh, I've saved the worst for last um, because um, this trail, uh, I'll just say, I'll say the lower portion of this trail is not fun. Um, this section of trail was heavily burned in 2011. Um, and so on a warm summer day, it's hot, it's dry, it's dusty. Um, portions of it are fairly steep. Um, you do have to do a little bit of root finding in one section, so it's challenging in that sense. But if you stick it out and get all the way up to connect with the Timberline Trail, um, you have a couple of options uh, to explore, one of those being the Barrett Spur, which um, gets you way up above Timberline with some really impressive views of Mount Hood, um, but uh, you got to be willing to work for it. And because, again, this is a pretty remote trail, requires a lot of work, the lower portion is not the uh, best conditions, not a lot of folks are heading to this one. So a uh, good way to get away from those crowds, enjoy some really great scenery, get a tremendous workout while you're at it, um, and uh, exercise some of that safe social distancing this summer. So that's my 10 hike suggestions for um, social distance hiking on Mount Hood this summer. Uh, information about all of these hikes, again, can be found in my new guidebook, Day Hiking Mount Hood. It's available from Mountaineers Books right now. Um, as you can see down at the bottom of this page here, if you go to mountaineers.org slash books, um, you can get it for 25% off with uh, the checkout code time to read. Um, and for more information, um, feel free to visit dayhikinghood.com and uh, for information about staying safe out there and more um, uh, suggestions for um, uh, being safe and uh, healthy on trail this summer, you can visit recreateresponsibly.org. And then um, for uh, specific trail information regarding conditions and accessibility, especially as things are transitioning from spring to summer and you want to find out about roads to get to some of these more remote areas, uh, visit the Forest Service website, uh, which is um, fs.usda.gov slash main dot slash Mount Hood. And uh, from there, you can check trail conditions, road conditions, and get other information about how the forest, uh, what the conditions are and how the forest is reopening in response to uh, the new normal that uh, we're all going to be um, hiking with this summer. So that's my program for tonight. Hope you all enjoyed it and got some useful information out of that, I'm going to kick it back to Aaron and uh, we'll continue our program. So thank you very much. And I am going to move things over to Eric. All right, great. Aaron, let me know when my uh, screen is up and ready. You're up. Great. Well, um, and uh, we'll get to some question and answer for both Eli and myself uh, after, in, a, in a few minutes here. But um, I, I spend a couple minutes here talking about uh, 
making sure that we uh, don't just take our, our mountain for granted as our favorite place for recreation, but we also do our part to, to protect Mount Hood and the Gorge. Um, I think we all, we all love Mount Hood, we all love the Gorge, um, and maybe we value them for different reasons. Maybe it's where we get our, our drinking water, or maybe it's where we go for our favorite hikes, or where we go to uh, get have find peace of mind uh, in troubling times. Um, so a lot of different reasons to to love and cherish Mount Hood in the Gorge. Um, and so I think as we are moving forward, um, we're looking to try to find a a new vision for how do we balance all of the the interest in conservation, a sustainable trail network, um, how do we balance wildlife needs and carbon storage and all these different issues that are kind of swirling around Mount Hood in the Gorge. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that now and um, some exciting uh, possibilities there. So as a reference point, the uh, current plan for the Mount Hood National Forest, as you can see, I've circled it in uh, red there, it was uh, finalized in 1990. So that means it was written in the 1980s. And uh, you know there was some good, interesting science around then, but we've learned a lot uh, since that time. And so we are um, looking to incorporate new science and, and everything that has changed since then. And boy, does it feel like the world has changed in just the last few months, uh, last few weeks, let alone since uh, 1990. Um, so what what is the vision? Um, you know, there's the, that old Forest Service plan that's now 30 years old, um, pretty dusty. Um, and so we could, you know, that was supposed to be a 10 to 15 year plan uh, that the Forest Service would then update and incorporate new science and, and new dynamics for what's happening on the mountain. Um, that, that hasn't happened. We're 30 years in. Clearly, they're not getting to it. And so, um, I think there's, uh, I'm, I'm not holding my breath that the Forest Service is going to update that plan anytime soon. So the alternative is Congress can pass legislation um, to find a better path forward and a modern vision for Mount Hood in the Gorge. And, um, you know, we have, uh, Congress passed legislation in 2009. That was something that Oregon Wild and a number of partners uh, worked on. And that was a great step in the right direction, did a lot of good things. But here we are 11 years later um, and realizing that didn't, that didn't solve everything. Um, and so we still have some, some issues that need to be addressed. Um, and so for the last 10 years since that bill passed, we've been doing outreach to a lot of different corners and different stakeholders that are that care and love the mountain. Um, we've met with a lot of different recreation interests. We've met with elected officials, members of Congress, county commissioners. Uh, we've met with the Warm Springs tribe. Um, a lot of different outreach to figure out uh, what kind of feedback people have on the ideas we have to get input. Um, you know, lots of other good ideas out there. How do we bring all of those ideas together? Uh, into a new vision uh, that really truly balances conservation and recreation uh, for Mount Hood and the Gorge, um, rather than just that 30 year old plan that was really written at a time when logging was the priority for our public lands or, or one of the dominant priorities for our public lands. Um, so what, what we've come up with is um, a, a proposal that includes new wilderness protections, Wilderness kind of being the gold standard for how we protect our public lands. It doesn't make sense everywhere, um, but where it does make sense, that that is the most lasting way to protect your public lands for future generations of people and wildlife. Um, another tool that is a, a, a part of the mix uh, is a wild and scenic river designation. Um, and that oftentimes can be very helpful at protecting uh, drinking water, recreation, scenery, um, and then I think with this vision, um, a lot of the discussion is really revolved around a national recreation area as an umbrella designation um, for a big portion of Mount Hood and exactly what the boundaries are going to be. There's different opinions and, and different maps, um, but some, some good ideas happening there um, as far as um, how we might have a, a new plan that really balances all these uh, demands that are, are and all the pressure that the mountain is feeling. Um, it, it can 
help to um, address carbon storage. It can help to protect clean drinking water. It can help design a sustainable trail network um, so that it allows wildlife to not be totally impacted by uh, where we're all recreating. So a lot of different things swirling in there. Another really interesting one is uh, the transportation issues, which I think all, any of you who are uh, recreate up on Mount Hood or in the Gorge are, are increasingly painfully aware of some of the, the challenges with getting to and from the mountain uh, or into the gorge. You've probably seen the, the parking lot full sign at Multnomah Falls, or if you try to go skiing on a bluebird day in uh, January, you'll spend too much time on the road and not enough time uh, in the snow. And so how do we, how do we fix that? Um, what are the solutions there? And one of the solutions, you know, there's no silver bullet for any of this, but there are a package of solutions that together, I think, um, create a better vision and a better, um, a better plan uh, for the future. And so, you know, for the transportation piece, it's looking at ideas uh, like encouraging a um, a rideshare program or public transportation from those gateway communities. So Sandy um, and Hood River, maybe Troutdale, and looking at how we might do that because certainly everyone getting in their car and driving up separately to the mountain, lots of things that are not ideal about that. One, you need a lot more parking lots. Two, that's a lot of people in a lot of cars and a lot of pollution, and that's not good for climate change. So having more public transportation to and from the mountain that stops, you know, in the winter that stops at snow parks and ski areas, and in the summer stops at maybe a couple campgrounds and some trailheads. Um, these are the kinds of solutions that I think uh, we need to be uh, really focusing on for the future of Mount Hood and the Gorge. Um, and, and transportation is an, an, a really interesting one. There are so many different aspects to it. Um, an, another component of that is looking at what, well, many of us uh, love to recreate and go recreate on Mount Hood every chance we get. There are underserved communities that have not enjoyed that privilege over time. And so how do we make it easier for everyone to access Mount Hood? Um, and so that's another interesting part of this equation. And so exploring what are the barriers there and how do we get rid of those barriers um, so that everybody can enjoy their public lands. Um, and then also, uh, you know, very important that we make sure that any plan for Mount Hood and the Gorge respects uh, Native American interests and values. Mount Hood, uh, in the Native Americans refer to it as Y East, um, whether that, so that means respecting uh, treaty rights, um, access to first foods, um, and, and a variety of other um, issues. So um, lots lots of ideas and, and pieces to kind of incorporate into the plan, kind of getting into a few of those now. I, I don't know about you all, but for me, the last couple of months has really gotten me to reflect on some of the more fundamentals of life um, on the coronavirus front and, you know, clean drinking water being one of those fundamentals that we just kind of take for granted. And if you live anywhere near Mount Hood, uh, Clackamas or Hood River or Portland or Lake Oswego, Westland, Oregon City, all of these communities get their drinking water from the Mount Hood National Forest. And so how do we ensure that we are safeguarding that source of a real fundamental of clean drinking water? Um, and, and this proposal would really prioritize that. Um, Oregon's, our, our forests are amazing filters uh, to make sure we've got clean water. Um, it's a lot cheaper than having to build more filtration and treatment plants. Um, and, and it provides some, some of the best water. If, you're, if beer is your thing, um, you're very well aware that you can't have good beer without good water. And so we've been able to create some partnerships with a lot of different breweries around the mountain that understand how important the forests are to ensuring that we have clean water for beer, for wildlife. Um, so it's all it's all connected. Um, so I have a quiz question for everyone. You can think about this for a second. Um, and this is uh, looking at it through the, the lens of wilderness protection. What percentage of the state of Oregon has been permanently protected as wilderness? And I'll give you a couple of clues. The state of Washington has protected about 10% of their state as wilderness. State of California, a bit more progressive, has protected about 15% of their state. And unfortunately, despite our green reputation here in Oregon, 
um, we had not always lived up to that reputation and have only protected a very small uh, percentage of our, our, our state and our public lands as wilderness. We can do better. Uh, we need to do right by Mount Hood and the Gorge and our other public lands um, to make sure that they are protected for future generations of people and wildlife. Um, perhaps the most embarrassing part of that statistic is that uh, the liberal progressive bastion of Idaho has protected significantly more of their state than Oregon, and um, that's a little embarrassing. We, we, we need to do better. Um, another reason uh, why uh, a new vision, a new plan for Mount Hood is important, um, carbon storage. Um, you look at this list, this is... Um, what are where are the uh, most effective uh, carbon storing forests in the country and this is on a per acre basis so um, how much carbon per acre can you store in that forest and as you can see from this list a lot of oregon's forests rank really really high mount hood comes in at number six um, we all need to drive less we all need to change our light bulbs um, but the biggest impact we can have as oregonians in the fight against climate change is to protect our forests. Um, the trees, the, the cedar trees and the Douglas fir trees that grow around Mount Hood, uh, they can live, they grow quickly, they grow big and, and wide, uh, i.e. read lots of carbon stored, and they can live for 800 to 1,000 years. So that's really, really, really long carbon storage, and that's really what we need right now. Um, so more conservation has a lot of benefits of protecting our forests for the fight against climate change. And so that would, you know, as we envision this plan, um, the National Recreation Area, the wilderness, the wild and scenic rivers would all have an eye towards uh, maximizing carbon storage in our forests. So, you know, again, to, to have this type of plan move forward, um, question of the day is, will Congress rise to the occasion? Um, and, and I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, we looked at uh, last year, um, Senator Wyden and Congressman Blumenauer held uh, two different forums, one in Portland, one up on Mount Hood, to look at what is the future of public lands. Um, and one of the common themes was, you know, how do we better protect Mount Hood? How do we not love it to death? How do we address climate change, uh, sustainable trails, wildlife? All these issues kind of came up. And so, they seem interested. We need to um, make those phone calls. Uh, it's a two-second Google to find their phone numbers for, for any of those folks I've got listed there. And those phone calls matter. Um, you don't have to be an expert on the subject. Most likely, if you call their office, uh, you'll get a, a friendly uh, voice on the other end that will not grill you and ask you lots of tough questions. Uh, they'll just ask you what what message you'd like to pass on to the senator or the congressperson. And so, you know, really sharing a simple message of, you know, we need a better plan to to protect Mount Hood and the Gorge um, goes a long way. And it really does make a difference. I talk to their staff on a pretty regular basis and they're tracking what they're hearing from the public. And so um, really helpful. I know there's a lot of activism happening right now on a lot of different issues. So add this to your list, uh, put it in where appropriate. and um, Help, help protect Mount Hood in the Gorge. I've also got the uh, link to our petition there. Uh, pretty simple and easy, a couple of clicks and you can add your name in support. And, and then just for fun, a couple of places that uh, would get increased protection. Um, this is one of my favorite places, Boulder Lake, um, a really cool wilderness experience. Uh, kind of teeing off of Eli's uh, categories of what's crowded and not crowded this summer. Uh, Boulder Lake is kind of in the middle. Um, it's not the most crowded place. It's certainly not Mirror Lake, um, but you'll find some people there on, on a Saturday or Sunday, but midweek, it's not going to be very crowded. And there's also a lot of great trails. You know, the, the lake is the spectacular spot for a hot summer day for a swim. You've got the cliffs, the old growth trees, but there's a lot of great trails um, along Boulder Creek, up on the ridges, up to Bonnie Meadows. Um, Eli mentioned Bonnie Butte, which is kind of like right up uh, over the top of the photo here. So a number of uh, lesser known trails here that are going to be less crowded. So um, check out Boulder Lake. It's a little bit of a longer drive to get there. This is uh, basically on the south side of Badger Creek Wilderness, but highly recommend it. Here's another little quiz one for you. What waterfall is that? 
Um, rarely do you see it like this. This is in winter. This is what it looks like more oftentimes during the summer. Tomenowis Falls, um, definitely going to be one of those more crowded ones. But um, to the, the question of the day of, you know, how, how protected is Mount Hood or not protected, on the north side of the Tomenowis Falls Trail, just about a, a little over a thousand feet away, um, there's a proposal for more logging. Um, and so these areas, whether it's there, there's another proposal for more logging in the upper sandy watershed. The south side of Mount Defiance has a planned logging project on there. Um, so it's not all sunshine, rainbows, and lollipops up on our public lands. Um, they're definitely in, in conga lines, as Eli put it earlier. I've still got that vision in my head. Um, it's, uh, there are some legitimate threats still out there. And so, you know, having a better plan that balances wildlife, conservation, carbon storage, clean drinking water, all those good things uh, is, is, is needed now as much as ever. Um, another uh, epic spot. Yes, we, we have Crater Lake, our, our one and only national park. But uh, little known, little sister, uh, little Crater Lake. Uh, this is up right near Timothy Lake, and I think Eli mentioned it briefly. Um, it's pretty small, um, but it's pretty cool too. So check that out. Uh, not usually a ton of people there. Um, pretty neat, cold water. Um, great spot though. And so that wraps up my my uh, portion of the the presentation this evening. So I'm going to hand it back to Aaron, and so we can get into uh, some some Q and A for both Eli and I. Thanks, Eric. Uh, for uh, folks who have questions, there should be a little button over to one side. Um, since Eric just finished his presentation, we haven't gotten a lot of questions, though, for specifically for you, Eric, but maybe you'll have some things to chime in um, on some of uh, Eli's answers. Um, one of them, I'll, I'll kind of smash two together here. Um, in terms of wildlife on Mount Hood, um, we had one person asking about wild turkeys, another person asking about bears. What, what kind of, of wildlife uh, do we see on the mountain? And if we're looking to see wildlife, what are some good places to go? Or if we're looking to maybe uh, stay away from where bears might be uh, hanging out on very rich trails? Well, there's a, there's a big difference between what lives on Mount Hood and what you might see on Mount Hood. Um, a lot of the larger animals up on Mount Hood, uh, they tend to stay away from the trails in the popular areas because they don't want to have anything to do with people who might interfere with their young or their, or their feeding areas. Um, but I mean, as far as what's up there, I mean, we have deer and elk and black bears and um, there are bobcats, there are mountain lions, um, so that's that's your big animals. They're definitely up there. Now, whether you're going to see them or not, that's the other question. And the chances are very, very slim that you're going to see megafauna like that. Um, the bear sightings are, are so few and far between, and um, mountain lion sightings are even more rare than that. Um, unfortunately, a couple years ago, there was a mountain lion incident on Mount Hood on the west side in the foothills. That was actually the first recorded mountain lion attack in Oregon's history as a state. Uh, so, I mean, that was just, it was a fluke occurrence. I mean, that was like winning the lottery and getting struck by lightning on the same day. Um, the typical kinds of animals that you're going to see up on Mount Hood, obviously, are your squirrels and your chipmunks. Um, there's lots of birds up there. Um, gray jays, um, uh, little camp robbers, are more than happy to make friends with you and share your lunch, so watch out for them. Um, but um, if you do happen to come across uh, you know, a large animal, make sure to give it its space. Um, let it leave the area. Um, there are definitely um, uh, best practices to take if you happen across a bear uh, because you don't want to provoke the bear. So um, best thing is to talk softly, back away, let it leave the area. Um, there's other things to do if a bear appears to be aggressive. 
Um, and uh, those are outlined in my guidebook because you want to make sure you're responding to the bear properly so you don't escalate the incident. Um, but um, just uh, enjoy what's up there. Uh, the animals are fantastic. And um, if, uh, if you just be polite and respect their home, then um, they're going to, for the most part, leave you alone and uh, let you uh, continue exploring. Yeah, and I, I might just add a, a few things. I think Eli captured that pretty well, but um, one of the, the really exciting possibilities now for what wildlife you might see, you at least have a chance of seeing or hearing uh, that no one has had for 75 plus years is wolves. Um, wolves were hunted to extinction in Oregon uh, about 75 years ago and have slowly been uh, coming back. That's one of the issues Oregon Wild works on. Um, and while most of Oregon's wolves are up in Northeast Oregon, a few wolves down by Crater Lake, um, there, there is a, a wolf pack uh, up around Mount Hood, kind of in the, the White River, the, the sort of mid White River uh, area. And, and that, so that's pretty cool. Um, there's not many wolves and the likelihood of seeing them is pretty low, but you know, if you're out camping somewhere near there, the, the thought of being able to, to hear them howling at night uh, for the first time in generations is, is a pretty cool idea. Um, you can also, some of the, the higher elevations when you're in rocky areas, you might see uh, pika, which are this cute little uh, chirpy, uh, look kind of like the size of a, a um, small chipmunk or so. Um, those are those are out there and they're also endangered because of climate change so we want to protect those um, and then also another fun one to see is uh, salmon uh, spawning in the rivers so whether you're at Roaring River one of the Clackamas tributaries or maybe along the um, Salmon River near Welch's some good spots where you can see salmon spawning upstream um, Hood River uh, watershed has a few spots as well um, so some some great potential for for wildlife viewing. Um, lots of endangered wildlife up there as well, whether it's the spotted owl or others. Um, and then of course you've got your deer and elk as well. But um, yeah, that's that's the the short short and skinny on on wildlife. Yeah, the the to the person who specifically asked about uh, turkey, um, I I help run Oregon Wild's trail cam program, and I've never seen a turkey on the trail cam. That might just be our locations. Lots of of um, black bears um, and coyotes, uh, but I haven't seen a, a turkey. There are grouse up there, and um, they're they're most notable for exploding out of the brush mm -hmm. as you get close to them, and and every single time it scares them. Jesus out of me when they do that but they we just have, fly away <laughs> one attendee who says yep at zigzag the bears uh come to visit the garbage cans yeah uh, yeah I think uh, for turkeys I'm, I'm not a turkey expert but I think the most likely place where you might see turkeys around Mount Hood would be the the east slope so yeah more in the Badger Creek 15 mile creek uh where you get into more of the ponderosa pine oak uh habitats there um, Eli, what what do you know about Northwest Forest Passes right now? I, I was on the website the other day and I noticed they're not actually selling them. If you have a Northwest Forest Pass that's expired, is it extended? When do you have any um, information on that? You know, there was an advisory that came out in some of the reopening language about the Forest Service recently where it um, where it said that normal pass requirements are still in effect for most requiring trailheads. Um, now, as far as where you can get those, if the Forest Service is, I know you have the option of doing the, um, the uh, purchase and print forest passes on your own um, using, uh, I think it's, um, there's, a, there's a website that, um, is affiliated with the forest that um you can USGS purchase yes had them or yeah at least we had their yes and and there's another one um that of course is escaping my brain right now is it um, recreation.gov no it's not recreation.gov uh let me do a 
it's going to uh, I will find that and I will post that on dayhikinghood.com. Um, so look for that um, shortly after this program. But um, yeah, uh, they're they're asking for people to regularly display the normal passes as you would any other time. Um, and uh, at this time in particular, um, with a lot of uh, Northwest Forest Pass revenue going directly to local forests, uh, it's really important that they get um, any dollars they can in order to maintain services because everybody is strapped right now. So if you can support the forest by purchasing a pass, that would definitely be appreciated for helping with trail crews, maintaining restrooms, emptying those trailhead trash cans, etc. Um, as summer goes on, and this this is a, I'm quoting from a question, and things open up more, I'm thinking many of your trail suggestions could work well as overnight backpacks. Um, how will we know when it's okay to park overnight at trailheads? Um, well, there's presently there's no restriction per se on overnight parking. Um, the uh, the current day use. Um, Accessibility is is all just general advisory information. Um, you can access, um, you can use trailheads and enjoy backcountry travel, um, but you should plan to be completely self-sufficient and um, be aware of the conditions that you're getting into. Right now, a lot of those trails that I actually showed this evening are not quite accessible yet because they're pretty high up on the mountain. So they would still be under a lot of snow. Those roads might not be accessible yet. But um, as you know, things melt out um, and things open up even more and become more accessible, then you can you can expect to be able to get up into the backcountry and enjoy some camping up on the mountain. Um, uh, uh, especially those. Uh, few trails that I mentioned on the north side, uh, the Pinnacle Ridge and the Elk Cove area where you can um, access the north side of the Timberline Trail. There's some fantastic camping up there, very secluded spots, really picturesque places to uh, avoid crowds and enjoy the backcountry without anyone else nearby. So, um, but um, again, you know, look for that to really start to open up, you know, well into summer so that that, uh, so that those trails are snow free and and um we're talking you know probably late July early August and um keep in mind um also that um early summer is mosquito season so if you're getting up on the mountain as soon as it melts out be prepared to deal with mosquitoes um here's another question i have a hiking group is it appropriate to take a group hiking this summer? And what is the appropriate number to be hiking? Um, Eric, feel free to chime in if you've got more information. My understanding right now is that the recommendation is 10 people maximum group size based on uh, um, the OHA's recommendations. And those should be people that you are normally in close proximity to um, on a regular basis and not introducing strangers into your into your group or your close proximity. Um, and of course, if you're going to be in a group situation, they're still advising everyone wear masks, um, exercise, really good hand hygiene, and um, still try to maintain that physical distancing of at least six feet while stationary and at least 12 feet while in motion um, so that um, you're not uh, sharing a lot of your, your breathing with your fellow hikers. Um, but uh, that's, that's what my understanding is with regards to the current situation. Eric, do you have any, any other information? I, no, I, th I think you covered it pretty well. I think it's just one of those things to keep an eye on as you know we we dance through the different phases of reopening and different counties have different approaches. Um, just to keep an eye on on what the the recommendations are there. Yeah, it seems with the the things change almost weekly. So 
Um, you can find all that information on um, OHA's website um, because they keep uh, keep that updated on almost a daily basis. And I believe there's a newsletter that you can sign up for so that you get the daily alerts about the situation going on with regards to the reopening and the current advisories. Oh, and OHA is Oregon Health Authority. Um, for people that are backpacking the Timberline Trail, uh, do you have recommendations for people who may want to extend that hike as, as day hikes off of, as spurs off of that route? As spurs off of the Timberline Trail? Um, hmm. Well, that's, there's that's an a unusual question. Yeah, I mean, there are there are definitely there are definitely things to explore off of the Timberline Trail. Um, the things that come to mind um, offhand are um, on the west side, Yoakum Ridge, which climbs way up into the Alpine off of the Timberline Trail. Um, that's kind of uh, between the Ramona Fall, the Sandy River and the Muddy Fork area. Um, let's see, of course, um, let's see, as you kind of, let's see, going from there and then curving around the mountain clockwise, once you get over onto the north side, um, you can uh, you can explore Eden Park. Um, that's um, that's down below the Timberline Trail. Um, the upper portion of the park was burned pretty badly in the Dollar Lake fire about 10 years ago. But um, once you get through that burned area, Eden Park is still pretty nice. And you can go uh, you can go frolic through the meadows down there. There's lots of wildflowers in the summertime. And then um, you uh, connect with, uh, I believe it's the Mazama Trail and uh, that will lead you back up to reconnect with the Timberline. Um, that is an option that um, I have listed in my uh, guidebook as something that you can do because uh, the book also covers the entire Timberline Trail um, with uh, some side trip recommendations. Um, continuing around to the east side, um, you can go and explore the Gnarl Ridge and Elk Meadows. Um, that um, is a particularly busy area, so if you're going to try to practice that social distancing and stay away from crowds, I probably wouldn't recommend that one this summer. Um, and then uh, let's see, getting farther around, let's see, uh, you, let's see, cross the White River, Timberline Lodge. Um, there's a lot of little little trails in and around Timberline Lodge that go through what I call the rock garden area that are fun to explore. Um, nothing long or strenuous, but uh, they're just kind of some detours. Um, and then, um, of course, there's, uh, again, there's Paradise Park kind of getting back around to the west side. Um, you can get off the Timberline, and uh, which uh, at that point also overlaps with the Pacific Crest Trail and uh, get up into the Paradise Park area. And um, that's pretty wide open, easy to keep uh, some distance away from, from crowds while you're out roaming the area. Yeah, I, I think Eli, you touched on some, some great ideas there. The one thing that I would add that um, this has me thinking about is if you're hiking the Timberline Trail, you're actually in a great position to be able to hit some of those more crowded areas like Eden Park or Paradise Park if you time it right because you'll be camping up there so you could do say the Eden Park loop off of the trail uh, you know first thing in the morning during wildflower season and totally beat the crowds um, mm -hmm. so that would be a, a pretty great way to do it so I think there's some really good potential there if you can kind of space those out time those right so that you're able to do those you know, either at the end of the day or preferably at the, the, the first thing in the morning, um, some, some really good potential there. Yeah, and on top of that, that's a great suggestion, but uh, I would add to that not only time of day, but time of week. Um, if you can get up and do your hiking midweek, um, that's a good way to uh, avoid a, a lot of the excessive crowds that show up on weekends. Um, and we'll make this the last question. Um, Eric, how do we get the word out about helping to um, protect the mountain? 
Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, you know, you can, that petition, um, you can just, it's not up right now, but um, on our website, Oregon Wild, um, Mount Hood, that's a, a great thing to sign yourself, share it with your friends. You can share it on social media. Um, you can get on the uh, Oregon Wild email list. If you're not already on it, you probably got the option to um, be added to that list um, so that when there are um, different uh, opportunities to weigh in um, and, and actually quite timely, uh, Senator Wyden is hosting uh, a couple of uh, a regional virtual town hall I think for the Hood River area. So if you are a resident of Hood River, I think in it's Wasco County, I think they've got a, a couple different counties. Um, and, and I just found out about that today. I think it's happening, uh, it's either on the 12th or the 15th, um, but we'll we'll post that on, um, maybe in the, in the follow-up email to this. Um, that, that would be a great way to um, weigh in with um, a question or a comment for Senator Wyden, let him know you support uh, increased protections um, and a new vision for Mount Hood and encouraging your friends to do so. So if you live in Portland, but you've got friends in Hood River, um, give them a nudge, um, have them have them do it. It's even easier than going to a regular town hall, which is pretty easy. You just sit in and do it at your computer. Um, I, I attended one uh, of Senator Wyden's recently, a month or two ago. It was a virtual dynamic and, um, uh, pretty easy, you know, best we can do in these strange times. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, the question and how to how to spread the word. It's it's uh, it's been a very grassroots effort putting this together over the last 10 years. And so um, sharing it with your friends, if you're leading a hiking group, have a conversation uh, with them. Um, so, yeah, social media is 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 kind of the, the good way to share things these days um, because there's not as many in-person ways to to do that spreading of the, the good word. And I lied, I'm gonna do one more question because I think it covers a lot of the ones that I, that I wasn't able to get to. And that's, um, is there a good resource for figuring out what the snow levels are? So uh, people have a better idea of when hikes are opening up. A um, couple of the options that you can uh, check out are the uh, webcams for the Timberline Lodge and the uh, Mount Hood Meadows ski areas. Um, those are both in the, uh, let's see, Timberline Lodge is at about the 6,000 foot level. Um, the Mount Hood Meadows base, I believe, is around the 5,000 foot level. Yep. Um, but um, and they have a variety of webcams that look up and down the mountain. So that would probably be my first recommendation uh, for uh, what the condition is. And those are live webcams. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, what the condition is at any given time. Um, and then um, uh, you can always um, call the uh, local ranger district office for the forest service that manages um, that portion of Mount Hood, which you're interested in visiting, because while those uh, offices are not open to the, while those ranger stations are not open to the public, uh, there are still rangers and backcountry personnel working in those offices who uh, would likely have some current information. Um, for the west side of Mount Hood, that would be the, uh, the zigzag district, for the east side, it's the Hood River District. Um, for the uh, north side, you might be looking at the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area Office. Um, and if you're heading way south of, um, of uh, Mount Hood, that would be the Barlow District Office. Um, and uh, those are uh, all accessible on the main Mount Hood National Forest webpage with uh, phone numbers. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, pretty soon here we're going to be most all of the snow is going to be melted out off of Mount Hood proper. Um, so it's really what we're talking about for the rest of the summer is kind of gauging where the snow level is on on the mountain itself. Um, and the the only other thing I would uh, encourage folks is there are a lot of what we call trip reports that you can find on the internet. So people who have been up there recently. Uh, Portland Hiker is one website that has a lot of those. 
Um, there are a few others. So if there's a particular trail you're interested in, um, you can try Googling that trail and, and look for, and, and, you know, say uh, Eden Park trip report or whatever trail it is you're looking for. Um, and then I, I always trust most uh, a report from somebody who went up there recently and said, snow's clear, mosquitoes have come, mosquitoes have gone, uh, whatever exactly it is. I Sometimes when you call, I call the Forest Service office, you get really good info. Sometimes you don't. So I'm, I'm always, I would, I, I hedge a little bit on that one, um, just because they sometimes are sharing information that's maybe a little dated or their best guess, but not, not actually from a report of somebody who was out last week. Um, so yeah, those are that and all of the other ways Eli mentioned. And I just, uh, uh, we had a commenter. I just put a link. Um, in the chat, which you can also find a link to get Eli's book um, in the chat right now. Um, and with that, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank Eric and Eli for presenting, and uh, we'll see you all next week. All right, bye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye.